Hello everyone and welcome back to the Lost Wisdom of the Earth Tele Summit. Now anyone who has taken the time to form a relationship with the yew tree knows of their extraordinary presence and otherworldliness. My guest today is a yew shaman and he spent many years communing with an ancient yew which not only healed him from a life-threatening illness but also gave them, him the template for a shamanic practice and a mystery school based upon its direct teachings. His work brings us directly in touch with a world our ancestors would have been fully aware of, but one from which we have become very sadly estranged. He is Michael Dunning. Michael, welcome. Thank you, Sarah. It's a real delight to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Yes, and it's, I, I really appreciate you giving time to this because I know how busy you are. And, uh, and uh, yes. So I appreciate it's the end of your work day. I appreciate you sort of squeezing <laughs> me in, as it were, at the end. Oh, it's uh, yeah, it's it's still light and sunny over here. It's about ninety-seven degrees. Oh, don't make me jealous. We've, it's, you know, here, here we are. You know, it's supposedly summer, and I've actually got the heating on here. <laughs> <laughs> you know what the British weather is like. <laughs> Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. I'll be coming over there shortly to sample it, too. Yes. So, well, uh, bring your woolies. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> right, let's, can, can we, can I, I start by asking you to give us a little bit of your story? Because, I mean, just in that brief introduction, you know, you spent years with the yew tree. What, what was that all about? Well, it was a sort of a stage in, in, a, in a process that goes right back to, really to, right after I left the art school, back into the 80s, um, around about 86, I was an art student. Mm. I left art school and found myself up in the very north of Scotland um, in a place called Thurzo, which um, is, uh, I think it's the northernmost part of Scotland on the mainland you can, yeah. you can reach. <laughs> and, you know, ironically to, to be involved in a tree planting um, uh, seasonal job planting trees yeah and mm. so that's that was the beginning of the story for me it was um very close to the dunray nuclear reprocessing plant which was kind of grim mm. area and it was it was in that place that i had my an encounter with a being that over the years i've come to describe as the sulfur demon um it was right. a doesn't sound a, pleasant it was not a pleasant experience and it mm. was a, a experience that sort of ruptured my health and, and my sense of reality. Mm. And I, you know, I've talked about it before and I've, I've written about it here and there over the years now trying to make sense of it. And it was an experience that was um, of a, a being who's, you know, of, of a power and a presence that, that uh, is almost unimaginable. Mm. Uh, and you know a sense that I had at the time that I was not going to survive the encounter yeah but um, I did survive it uh, but it was to lead to some very strange health uh, effects yeah and, and uh, tremendous uh, distortions of, of what we would understand as reality yeah uh, to the point where I was really becoming um, uh, unable to live uh, yeah independently i mean what what it sounds like you're describing there is almost um like mental illness but it isn't it's all it's possession by something and it makes me wonder how many others are suffering from the same you know it's a really good point and you know it was, it was kind of ironic because at the time i was actually working for uh, around that time i was actually working for an arts non-profit Mm. And I was I was responsible for working with adults who had an experience with mental uh, mental health problems. Yeah. So I, so I was in and out of um, you know uh, psychiatric hospitals and some mm. locked some locked wards and places like that. And uh, my reality was so shattered. Yeah. And there I there I was taking in books on Matisse and Picasso and trying to sort of muddle my way through and help people to sort of somehow use the arts to, to gain some some midline in their in their lives so it was a strange time to be in that but yeah. um but i could really feel the i could i really felt i really felt a deep affinity with the people i was in i was i was going to, to yeah see. yeah um, but yeah 
And I think many people have encountered uh, very extreme situations like this. Um, I, I haven't, to be honest, heard of anybody who's in, had encountered th this particular being, this kind of being, uh, ever. But mm. um, uh, the, the, the being was certainly a, of uh, sulfur, and it was, I, I sense it was an ancient being yeah. coupled, coupled to the ancient earth. Yeah. These con conditions of being were, were, were really linked to an older manifestation of the earth yeah um, prior to its physical hardening in the way we understand it now so almost like a being who'd been drawn down when certain changes took place and um the way you would imagine sulfur being kind of bound to the earth yes um, so like the, uh, the kind of as we as matter became more dense it almost got trapped do you think yeah there was a sense of the being um being I feel now, in retrospect, a sort of a guardian of the early forces of the earth. Right. Um, sort of uh, enfolded into the current earth. Yeah. Uh, and, and my sense is it was a year after Chernobyl disaster. Mm, so, yeah. so, you know, I was there. I see it was only a few months, really, when I, when I think back after that. So there I was mm. in this really quite bleak place. Um, you know, right next to a nuclear reprocessing plant, but this being having arisen. <laughs> his place on it. No. So this being, I feel now looking back, this being was actually arising as a response to certain things that were going on in the world at that time. Yeah, and you were just in the, well, I was going to say the, the wrong place at the wrong time, but actually it turns out it was probably the right place. <laughs> it, it was. It, it's a very hard thing to, to, to talk about, and it's a very hard thing to... I always, I'm always reluctant to describe the experience really in, in its in, in, in fully, but you know, the next morning after the experience that happened through the night, everything else was normal. Nobody else in this little pocket. We lived in the middle of a field and yeah. broken down caravans. Nobody else had been affected by it. It was just just me. So mm. that was a strange thing because I knew I had been changed, yeah. and yet no nobody else around me had been changed or affected or had even noticed anything strange. It must so, be scary. It was a terrifying encounter uh, that shook me um, for years and years to come mm. and, and uh, for af afterwards. And, st and st it's still an experience that um, I do feel uh, the presence of that being uh, in my life yeah. still. So, so it was really that experience that, that was the beginning of a, of a whole trajectory Mm. of uh, my health falling apart mm. and a sense of being guided slowly through a series of events to yeah. to an ancient yew tree in the southeast of Scotland. Mm. And when you say ancient, how ancient? Well, therein lies a, therein lies a, a <laughs> controversial uh, point because there's, the, the, there's um, maybe something to talk about later if you like more in mm. detail, but the, the, the it's very difficult to estimate the ages of these trees mm. unless a specific planting date is known. Uh, and, and some of those we do have access to planting dates by, you know, in sort of monks in the yeah. 11th or 12th century and so forth. Uh, but these trees in Scotland, particularly around the tree I spent time under, there's no church next to that tree. And it is, um, it doesn't have a very wide girth mm. and, and a, and a Traditionally, a lot of the ages of these ewes were, were measured um, uh, by using a girth measurement to give some kind of estimate of an age. Yeah. Mm. So, and we'd often find that the girths would be, of some of these ewes in England are quite enormous. Mm. So there were certain, there were certain uh, let's say, certain positions put forward that well, for you to be so many thousands of years old, it should have a girth of such and such yeah. uh, feet. But this tree flies against all of these categorizations because it's actually quite a, uh, a narrow girth for a, an ancient yeah. view. But it actually grows out um, from the trunk as a great arcing Gothic cathedral-like branches back to the ground in a perfect circle and then creates clones of itself, practically another you forest out to the periphery. Wow. Creating a 400 foot circumference. So this, this is a vast organism. Yeah, yeah. Um, a great cathedral like organism spreading. Mm. And it, like an inverted cauldron, I'll often say, 
Yeah. And it has a long sort of umbilical tunnel. It's sort of 40 feet or so long to get into it. But you have to work right. through Some places and back then you had to sort of crawl in sections, bend down to get into. So um, what, took, a, what, what took you there then? <laughs> Because it doesn't sound like a natural pace to tip up. <laughs> it's n- no, it's a great question because it was, I, I, had, been, I had been unable to look after myself. Uh, my health had fallen into such mm. uh, so disrepair that um, uh, somebody had, had uh, a woman had agreed, she was agreed, she had sort of said to me, well, you, you can't live alone. And she had basically taken me to her cottage in yeah. East Lothian. Yeah. And was looking after me and helping me to, you know, to eat properly and mm. uh, or to, to start to eat again. I actually wasn't able to eat for a long time. So, yeah. and it was through being there and her introducing me to a tree surgeon, believe it or not, mm. who, through a process of visiting a pub, which, you know, there's a story in that too, yeah. we eventually found ourselves at this U in a very late at night. Mm. I, I didn't know what a yew tree was at the time. I mean, I had absolutely no conception of that. I mean, I'd lived mm. in a, I'd been brought up in a, in a, a sort of concrete, uh, yeah. sort of housing estate in, mm. in Fife, with with where the trees were just planted as we moved in. So there was really no green there. Yeah. Mm. So this this to me was another world. This Victorian high walled garden that I was suddenly introduced to this other world I didn't know existed of opulence and yet but yet opulence fallen into a sort of a chaos. Yeah. And an old lord, Lord Balfour, who was the the who was related to the Prime Minister Balfour, the one who signed signed the famous Balfour Declaration and all of the (laughs) all of the complications and and and, uh, complexities that are around that. Mm. But he was he was related to that Balfour and um the, the whole estate had become very overgrown and quite mm-hmm. wild mm-hmm. and left left to to its own devices so so I was taken by this tree surgeon to this great being in the middle of the night and um, uh, I entered that canopy and as soon as I made contact physical contact with that you I knew that I was in a I knew I had come home I knew that I was in a a place that was going to become very significant to me, although I had no intellectual understanding of that at the time. It was a very deep, profound experience to, yeah. to, meet, to meet that being. Mm. So, yeah. And you spent nine years with it? I did, yes. I was to spend just over nine years, sort of mm. between nine, nine, nine or nine and a half years under that. Yeah, year. that's, a, that's a big chunk of somebody's life. It is. It really is. And it was a time where many people were, you know, it's a time in life where it was a seminal time, a growing time, mm. a time, you know, where I, of course, had to find a way to have some sort of independent living. So I had to really steel myself to to get up and actually do interface with the world and yeah. try and try and generate some income mm. and, and, and things like that. But the you was my was my. Um, was my the, the great matrix the great mother for me that yeah. would would call me would beckon me at the most inappropriate times <laughs> uh, so you know, i'd be they, they the do kind of the test night. you don't they <laughs> they certainly do and and there's the, you, there's no ignoring the call of the you because it calls into your blood and there's a there's a compulsion there's a compelling quality quality that speaks directly into your blood and and draws you like a mm. suctional force that you you really are, you really have to heed the call of the you and and, uh, and this was really the way I would be summoned because I wasn't really feeling physically up to going even but I would be find myself there yeah um, sometimes from the middle of the night even so. and during during this time the you healed you I mean it it helped you deal with this sulfur demon banish it corral it understand it <laughs> i think all of that i mean the, the demon for me was more like the more of the vedic sense perhaps of demon of mm. of, of a dark I, I refer to it as a darkly shining being yeah it was it, it was a being of 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 great sort of ancient power that somehow had had in a way coupled with me at some mm. level 
Mm. Um, and there's a lot more to the story than, than, than this to, to uh, somehow had coupled to me and really changed my, my sense of matter, my sense of density, yeah. mm. my sense of being in the world, my sense of spatial orientation. Um, and it was, in a sense, there was a consuming going on because I, yeah. I was constantly smelling as though I was on fire. People wow. would often comment that, where's the burning electricity smell coming from? You know, it was me. And wow. you know, electrics would, would, you know, would burn up and, yeah. light bulb, you know, all of that sort of thing. Computer mm. systems would go down. Yeah. Um, and my hair was, would fall up, was falling out rapidly in great big clumps. Mm. My mass of my body changed in a strange way over a period of years. Mm. It's a sort of a, I'm actually quite a slight person, mm. but I felt, I felt an enormity of density that was uh, almost as though I was carrying this enormous weight of matter, like a sort of a, mm. a density, a, a, almost like a sub-matter. Yeah. It was almost as though I had experienced the death of matter in myself through human tangling with this whole nuclear piece. It was almost as though I was feeling something that had been, that had been, generated out of out of a, a sort of sub nature sub level of matter yeah. as, though mm. I, as though i had been forced to kind of experience something beneath what we can physically support uh, what matter can physically support like a sort of like a sort of um a corp the corpse of matter yeah. i felt as though i was dragging the corpse of matter around with me and it was wow. a, a density that was hard to um mm. to even uh, uh describe I felt as though it was, it, the closest you can probably th get a sense of it, it's almost it'd be like being under an enormous weight of water constantly, and every step was against a great yeah. weight. Every movement of the arm against the. Great I mean, that weight. takes enormous levels of energy to just cope with. Mm. It was a very difficult time, and um, it was very difficult to communicate to to others what was happening mm. so it was often pathologized or um mm. or just ignored or uh, people just really had a hard time though i really pushed their buttons and they found it very difficult it made them very uncomfortable yeah so there was a lot of casting off went on of, of <laughs> you know <laughs> friends and 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 shedding <laughs> shedding a great shedding took place and yeah. new people begin to began to come who were who were somehow understood and somehow were able to help me mm. to put the pieces of my life back together again. So going to the U was was where it began to. It was almost like the movement at the Sulphur Demon was a movement of compression, enormous compression. Yeah. Mm. And going to the U was like a decompression. Yeah. I mean, I'm simplifying something very very much here. Yeah. As though this the, there was another body that I was able to discover under the U that was actually my body and health. There was yeah. another body that was able to be on the periphery that was teaching me, that was able to, 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 to reveal to me the mm. vectors that I would need to go through in order to heal this. Yeah. So, that, so I felt that the sulfur demon in the you, and I understand this more and more in my own human fumbling way. Mm. I understand more that they're coupled beings, that the sulfur was somehow coupled to the ancientness of the you, they were both familiar with one another right. at a level that I'll probably never fully comprehend, but mm. there's something to do with the sulfur qualities, but also the iron of the you, because the you was often, often known as the iron wood. Yeah. Mm. And, you know, we know that, that there's a sense I got from the you of the, of his iron, been able to kind of been able to subdue the sulfur forces of the early earth. That there, yeah. was a, there was something in the U that was really sp speaks to this early uh, sort of coming into shape of the earth where, the, where if it wasn't for the raining down of this iron, this cosmic iron, there, there would really have been an atmosphere that would have been not conducive to life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the gesture I often feel there, and it's a wild thing to say, is that the U was part of a, a gesture of incarnation of the earth yeah and a pushing down of older forces that were that, that were actually not going to allow life to emerge and the the sulfur demon was also a, almost in a sense a part of that really earlier yeah yeah um, compressive force that that would have disallowed 
life as we understand it now. Yeah. So, so the two of them were in, were in a, a dynamic relationship. And it was somehow that bringing the, this will sound really odd, but somehow the, the sulfur being being, sulfur being coupling to me was, was somehow a, um, a reciprocity yes. of, of somehow that being coming back mm. into this, into this um, arena of the you. And without that there, I wouldn't have been able to heal. There was a, there's, there was a whole shape to that, that that is beyond my comprehension, really, and, and, yeah. and I attempt in different ways to put it into language. But something around that, all of that dynamic um, as part of the experience that I needed to have, mm. that without the sulfur demon, just going to a you would not have been yeah. enough. Yeah. But something around experiencing that intensity and then going to the you and actually the, 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 the opposite of yeah. this sense of being opened That's into this like possibility being, being pulled in and pulled out sort of thing I exactly mean, that, that, that is you know an amazing initiation isn't it it was it was a very it was a profoundly visceral mm. in, in the biggest sense of that word you know visceral that's beyond contained yeah. viscera yes. and you know <laughs> viscera on the outside and it was that saying that is really interesting though because that I tried as one does when you're going through experiences like that. I mean, yeah. where do you go to, to, who do you ask? Where do you get your guidance from? <laughs> and there was, there was nobody yeah. in a, a human form that was able to help me at that time. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it was only when through the direct experience mm. and looking at it and just continuously going deeper into that experience without having really any choice, yeah. And slowly realizing that the language that fitted the, the fitted the the shape of the the initiation, the shape of the healing, the language that closest worked for me was the language of our own origin, our own coming into being, our own embryological beginnings, our own embryological underpinnings. Mm. And it was as though the you was saying to me, "Yes, look to your origin for answers." Mm. Uh, you will find your, your answers in origin at all levels. And one of those levels was, was coming into um, conception. And st I studied that intensively and I began to see the, I, I began to see the language of my own healing. Um, so that the language of my origin, of our origin, yeah. was the same language as the healing that I was going through. It was the same power. Absolutely extraordinary. It, Mm. And uh, that became a principle of for me that I began to slowly, over the years, begin to work with as mm. um, as as a, an underlying principle to the healing work and also to the to the to the mystery school, the new mystery yeah. school. So mm. yeah. So. Well, well, I mean, I I did I I was talking to you. Um, uh, just beforehand, and I was saying to you, I've been to a, a yew forest called Kingly Vale, which is in the south of, of, of England, and how extraordinary it was. Uh, I mean, it's just, it's another space underneath all of these yew trees, and there is nothing else there, just the yew trees. And um, I had, I was with um, a group of friends, we were there to do some geomantic work, uh, and and we thought we were doing one thing and and it turned out something I, I even now I couldn't even be, I couldn't begin to tell you what happened under those yew trees all I know is we lost several hours when we emerged from them again the time had kind of slipped slipped away from us and it, and we we genuinely genuinely thought that we were at five o'clock in the afternoon and it was seven o'clock in the evening I, I, and if to this day you know it's just i, I go like what <laughs> what was that about <laughs> so so you know i i looked into yew trees and they are so old and so special but when you know when i read the books they say oh over two hundred thousand years old now that's a long time but but i have a sense that you would take it back before that as well well i mean no, where did you hear the two hundred thousand? i i what i i not usually you'll hear 
It will be it will be Wikipedia or somewhere like that. Oh, right. The the the, the U is a species that they were here before the oh sorry last I see what you age. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The the, yeah. the taxis taxis red viva red viva it goes right back to um, something like uh, two hundred eighty million years. But then if you trace it back to to the conifers, you're talking three hundred fifty yeah uh, million. And you know it's it's a being that's been around with us. Uh, for a massive extraordinary length of time yeah extraordinary length of time and, mm. and Texas Red Aviva um, is was this one and what we're thinking now in the U community is 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 reclaiming this notion of the U as a oneness yeah. as a single a single organism mm. that doesn't matter if it's Japanese U or uh, in, a Himal Himalayan U or whether it's a uh, um, uh, Texas Breva Folia from the Pacific Northwest or, or, or mm. Texas Breva it's it's all one being and there's a real sense that and i got this a lot from my experiences under the youth yeah of this originality having been almost like osiris kind of ripped apart yeah when the continents if you if, if you know you, we can think about it, it to sit in some ways as in a physical way of the continents being pulled apart you know the old yeah. pangea the shifts yeah and actually that this organism was then distributed across the landmass mm. Uh, in the different, uh, as this as, as it consolidated out, yeah, and uh, we have the world as it is today, because you see a certain configuration. You look at a map of the distribution of the U's, you see a sort of a, a horizontal pool through the through the central region of the uh, of the Earth, except mm. tends to follow the coal seams. Right. And also, interestingly, the Iron Belt. So you can think of the coal seams as this great abundance of vegetative life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that the earth was once so vastly vegetatively abundant, mm -hmm. massively so that we can't even really conceive of that now. Mm -hmm. well, we can take all the, all the trees in, in, in the world now and, you know, if we were to, you know, theoretically get coal from them, we would only get a few millimeters of coal. But you're talking about these mile, miles deep so the vegetative capacity, the vegetative, um, the, the the depth is, is, is of vegetation there was enormous. So the world was so incredibly abundant at that yeah. time. Mm. So so the U comes out of that 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 super organism of the earth, that great Gaia explosion yeah. of of super, you know the super organism of, yeah. of high creative force, and and it still maintains original creative force. That's the key with the you. Wow. It mm. has shunned developments that it's, 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 it's a tree that has held itself back to its more, and I use this word very cautiously, primitive state. Mm. In a more, it, it's a tree that has a foot. It still has its, so much of it in the great four time, in the, in, in the great primal times, in the way that it was. And it's able to, it's almost a custodian on earth of ancient generative force that we can no longer have access to. So that the but you it gives us a glimpse or a portal to that. Exactly. The you and its living gesture shows us mm. that it has access to forces that we can't understand. Mm. It can heal itself in ways that, that are not understood. It yeah. can change its dominated denomination. It actually stands above being a male or female but it can actually go, it can actually express male one year and female the other. It can suddenly produce a male section, a female uh, expressed you can suddenly produce a male section and vice versa. Mm. Use, use that have been decimated by storms will regrow again. again. Use that have been cut down will suddenly regrow. I have, a, I have a personal experience now of saving, I should tell you this because it's, it's an interesting just aside that gives yeah, us an yeah. example Mm. In in the little town here in the western Massachusetts, uh, there's a little town called Northampton, named as the many of them are after the English towns. And yeah, mm. um, so no, little Northampton here, which is a very progressive and very hip uh, little town here, yeah, had had an avenue of seven U's that were about 100 to 130 years old, and of course, conditions here allow things to grow quicker. Yes. So these mm -hmm. U's were quite established compared to what we have for that same time period in the UK. Yeah. So they had grown up in a line, and they had they had actually created a a sort of a ton, a sort of an arc, which which had created a tunnel of sorts. Yeah. So they're really beloved to the locals. 
and these trees were suddenly for the chop. Um, Why? The Army Corps of Engineers had decided that they were on a drainage dike uh, mm -hmm. for the Connecticut River. Yes. Yeah. Enormous powerhouse of a river passes right through here. And right next to where I'm sitting right now, there's, uh, <laughs> uh, there's a, and which is really why I have my off my healing office here. Mm. Because I'm, I'm on the banks of the Connecticut River, and I love the river. It's a very yeah. powerful, powerful river. Yeah. Great serpentine powerhouse that comes down from Canada and um, all the way down through Massachusetts and into Connecticut. And uh, when, it, when it has in the past flood, flooded, it's, mm. bad, it's bad news. So mm. the Army Corps of Engineers decided they're for the chop. And I tried, and it's uh, here in the U.S., you've got federal and state. Mm. So it wasn't a state issue, it was a federal issue. So yeah. I couldn't really talk to the state. They were very sympathetic talk to the town, very sympathetic, but it was because it was a federal state. Anyway, long story short was I went to visit the crew who were doing the cutting. Mm. It was completely impromptu, and I just went, and I gave them a lecture on the on the use. These big, gruff guys who were ready to <laughs> go. They had already actually started working. It was, pretty, it was a fairly dec decimated site when I got there, actually. Yeah. It was really, very, very hard to see. But the boss, the gaffer, was very sympathetic, and he really he and I really connected and he said, what do you want me to do? Yeah. We have to cut them down. I said, I tell you what, if you can take the root systems of these trees, bear in mind now, he's already cut them down to about yeah. three, the, a stump, yeah. talking stumps. Yeah. I said, if you can be careful as you can with the root systems and take them and rebury them, yeah. I'll try and get, find a way of bringing them to my land. And yes. I have some land in Massachusetts uh, mm -hmm. nearby. Yeah. So we sa we saved two root systems. Wow. And well done, um, you. God. Yeah. I mean, that in itself is a miracle. A twenty-seven foot truck to get two <laughs> of these massive root systems onto. It was a big project. And, yeah. Uh, I can imagine got, again. I mean, I mean that's. Mm. The, yeah, the root plates are big, and mm. and we got we got these two root plates into the ground. Three years went by, nothing, no sign of life, and I had thought, well. The trauma that these trees have yeah. gone through is immense. Yeah. yeah. And just at the end of the, into the, in the spring, this spring, the snows were receding. And around the base of one of the yews, there was a little shoot of yew growing out of the, one of the root systems. Wow. And that shows you that out of this traumatic yeah. experience of the yew, of mm -hmm. being decimated, of being cut back to a trunk, Absolutely Everything mutilated. Mm. Totally mutilated. Anything else would have died. Then mm. taken in a truck mm. and then replanted. And then mm. three years later, this, this shoot of you has grown out from yeah. it. So that gives you an indication of its rejuvenative power. Yeah. I mean, there's, and, a, there's a level of tenacity to life there. Oh, yeah. 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 Yes. Yes. And where does it come from? That's the thing that I mm. always ask myself. Because where does that, where does that burgeoning life What's the source of that life in a you? Because for me, it was a source that healed me. It was a source yeah. that wasn't available to me outside of the you. Yes. You know, and I would it, not. I was going to say, I mean, we, we talked about, you know, the you possibly being a, a portal, as it were, to, to something else. I don't know. Would it be another dimension or something? Is that where it's pulling that from? Very much, you know, very much. And, the teaching that I've had over the year, over the years, is that it's really a, it's a being that's very deeply in partnership with what we call the other world, or yeah. in Welsh, Anun. Anun, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and and, that's, and that's not, you know, just for folks listening, that is not hell, is it? <laughs> it is not hell. hell. <laughs> it's not hell. That, that was the Christianized version of, of uh, a world of pluripotency, mm. of uh, uh, what, the ancient, what the old people would call the shining land of death, Death with a capital D, which really was a world of abundant life. Yes. So the other world and all the Sumerian, um, the tablets, the Sumerian tablets that were discovered, um, tell us, they show us this dynamic, this gesture of heaven descending into the earth, the falling of the heavenly gods, the falling of the father gods mm. into the earth. And when they fell, they always fell into the underworld first. Mm. And that's a way of a schema of helping us to understand that none of that 
the earth that we understand today, of course, didn't exist. Yeah. And what the you was constantly showing me was that she was a being of the early earth in its most primal form yeah. as more of a cosmic being that had contracted and involuted yeah. and was responsible for the creation of the earth. But actual fact, the creation of the earth is driven from the other world. It's yeah. driven from Anun. Anun is the pulse of the earth. Anun is the life of the earth. Yeah. Without Anun, there would be no life. And mm. it's that, what I call the occulted within of the earth, yeah. that the you draws its power from. It is directly in relationship to the original forces that involuted to form what we understand as the earth now. We, you know, the whole idea of Gaia. Yeah, yeah. As, as that we know in this from, the, from, the, from the Gnostics and we understand this whole notion of the following of the, of, of the, of the, the Sophia down and down. Mm -hmm. She follows her creation downwards. And uh, she must, she's coupled to it. She must follow it. She must go with it. Yeah. She must, she must become it. Yes. And, and there's this whole notion of, of the you as part of that. The you as this primordial being that I've traced back to um, a being uh, equivalent to the Elohim. Mm -hmm. A being who and the has Elohim actually. Are, are sometimes called the shining ones. Am I right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. El, El means, is another word for shining. Uh, mm. We see it all over the place uh, in Akkadian and Sumerian, in the old Eng the old English word elf. Mm. We see it. We see it everywhere. This notion of this L being this root for this shining being, yeah. and being then therefore Elohim. Yeah. And we know in the 19th century that the U was directly related and, and uh, understood as, as as equivalent to Jehovah, right. Yahweh, yeah. who was one of the Elohim. So mm -hmm. there's a big story there. So this whole notion of this, this great primal, primal intelligence mm. having gone through a development that it's still going through. It's <laughs> not finished. And that's, what's, that's what the you has to teach us. Yeah. You know, can we awaken to the vector of development of the earth? Or, you know, and, and, and to do that, how do we birth the organs of perception in order to be able to, to go with the earth's development? So that I'm jumping there, but so mm. this whole notion of, of the other world as being this originating matrix of the earth mm. and this other world as being the life force of the earth and the you able to be, ab be able to draw and, and be resourced and sustained from that force and as an incarnated eternity on the earth. I mean, that's that is, what you is. It's an is incarnated eternity on the earth. Stunning. I mean, I've got a yew bush in my garden. It's not very big. Um, and it was totally smothered by something else, which I've cut right back. But, I mean, I just look at it and think, wow. But, I mean, after... <laughs> Like tomorrow morning, I'm going to be like, <laughs> it's almost like I need to, I need to <laughs> make an altar in front of it or something because all of a sudden I've not just, it's not just an amazing tree. This is, this is really something else. It's, it's, it's intelligence is, is beyond. It's a, it's an, an intelligence of an Elohim expressed mm. on the earth. Yeah. Uh, and one of the things I come back to often again is that, Look how many people are turning to plants now and the intelligence of plants. Mm -hmm. yeah. We know, the, a human being knows that in order to go with the development of the earth, in order to learn from, from where the earth is going in terms of its development, really, humans, we, we're not custodians. We, we're not adequate. We don't have the answers for that. We prove, yeah. of course. I mean, what I'm saying is almost ridiculous because we, we know it so well. Mm. And people are turning to non-human intelligence more and more and more for guidance and for me the you was something that was really showing that was yeah. that you in order for us to understand the earth and where the earth is going we need a teacher who is an incarnate teacher yeah not a dis not a disincarnate entity yeah yeah we need an incarnated eternity on the earth a being who's been able to successfully incarnate forces that 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 are godlike on the earth. Yes, yeah. Now, what other being is, has been able to do that? And um, the you is really the supreme godhead yeah. 
of the plant world in a way that has actually incarnated forces that, that are so incredibly powerful that we are talking about an incarnated eternity on the earth. We are talking about a being that is at the level of the Elohim. And rather than um, recognize this amazing teacher, what have we done? We've made bows and arrows out of it. <laughs> yes, yes. Now, we've oppressed it at every turn. Yeah, yeah. And because we feared it, mm. we've not understood it. There's been an understanding deep down of this immensity of this being. Uh, but with that comes great fear. Yeah. Uh, the church feared it, um, but yet sort of sought to come into relationship with it. Mm. Um, and the, you know, in the sixth century, the, the in the second invasion of the Romans, they they sought to to take sacred places devoted to the U and mm. Christianize them. Um, now, my friend Paul Greenwood has done wonderful research on this around Evering Bell in the north of England was the place of the sacred U tree. Yeah, that was then shifted to York. York itself means U town. Eboracum, the, the, the Romans called it. So yeah. the, first, the first Archbishop of York was really, he began his work up in Yevering, trying to, trying to kind of take where he knew the power sites were, because they knew this from their first time around, yeah. that when they fought the U tribes. Um, mm. And in some cases, found it very difficult to succumb these U tribes. Um, you know, the U tribes... Uh, would actually commit mass suicide by eating the U rather than succumb to the Romans in some cases. Yeah. So this is a this is a big story, and the mm. the so you have the church, the, the hegemony of the church, knowing that in order to 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 in order to to successfully do what they were intending to do, they needed to yeah. they needed to, to they needed to succumb the U. Yeah. Um, because the, this all of Europe and the British Isles was once called the Isles of U. It was sacred to these isles. Wow. Yes. Mm. All throughout Europe, you see U tribes, names of U tribes. You see the U showing up in all of the places. The U was sacred here. Uh, I, I say here, I'm sitting in Massachusetts. Sacred in, in the UK. I knew, so, I knew it was sacred to the Druids, wasn't it? Uh, very, very much. But, but I think. But much I think, before that as well, from the sound of it. Mm. Yeah. And for me, my sense is that there was a bardic, the bards understood it better. Yeah. And it's a strange thing to say. But for me, the bards come from an older teaching than the yeah. Druids do. Mm. Uh, and uh, that's always been my understanding that, mm -hmm. that I'll, go to, I'll go to the bards every time. Okay. You know, you know, <laughs> I'll go, I'll, yeah, I'll go down to, I'll, I'll, I'll take Taliesin's teachings any day of the week, you know. And uh, yeah. <laughs> that, that to me is a rich, a rich, a rich initiatory teaching. Um, mm. And there's a lot in that. We actually talk about that a lot in the U Mysteries uh, teachings. But. But, you know, one of the amazing things about the U is, and, and circling back a little to that, is that in all of its sentient living gestures, it tends to shun the sun. Mm -hmm. It tends to sun, shun the solar orb in the sky today. Yeah. It's, it's as if it speaks to us of a world that preceded the one that we are in now. Yes, yeah. And that is often why I'll talk about the U as being much more in relationship to the ancient the son of the ancient world, mm. which, which was always known as Saturn, not as the sun we see in the sky today. So, so in a way, the, the U comes from an older world system. Yeah. When the earth was in relationship to a different sun before the solar system was even in existence. Yeah. And that's a very controversial thing to say. And I've got myself in a lot of trouble from saying that. But that's what the U showed me. Historians <laughs> blanched, don't they? <laughs> yeah, yes. There's a, there's, I've, I've had a few comments like put it that way. <laughs> and, uh, that's okay, but that's okay for me because I, yeah. for me, this is more about the experience that the U kept revealing to me over yeah. and over again. Yeah. What she would show me: this is my world. This is where I am from. It was a yeah. great twilight world of endlessness. Yeah, a great world of an endless twilight. There was no real understanding of the measure of time. The measure was of eternity yeah. on its world. Mm -hmm. That's a description, as I found out later, of, an, of, of a certain stage of the manifestation of, of a Saturnian world. Right. You know, um, Steiner, Steiner, Rudolf Steiner talks about how, you know, the earth gradually kind of basically came into form. Um, and we sort of came down through the layers, as it were. Is it, again, 
something similar that you're talking about? You know, Steiner, Steiner really, there's a very interesting couple of things about Steiner here, actually, that might be mm. interesting for listeners. Well, first of all, the whole notion of old Saturn and the recapitulations of, uh, the, of the, this notion of the Earth as having once been a vast organism yeah. that, con- that contracts. And as it contracts, it leaves behind, it deposits what we understand now in our, as planets. Right. Of course, uh, that was not the case then. It was much more of a livingness. Yes. But the, the understanding of this gradual contraction of what was once a great organism that he called old Saturn, mm. that actually contracts and contracts and contracts until, until finally we have the system that we, we understand now. And even to the expulsion of the moon from the earth, which was created too much heaviness in the earth, strangely enough. Right. Mm. You know, I think even Darwin's son was talked about that, 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 that actually we, if we ever, in his time, I think he said, if you analyze the moon, you'll find it's actually made of the, it's made of, uh, you know, uh, rock from the earth. That, yeah, you know, yeah, that, yeah. Mm. There was a scooping out of the Pacific Basin or what, I can't, maybe I'm incorrect about that, but. Uh, I've heard something, yes, yeah, I've heard something. Yeah. Scooping out of this dross, this, this, the earth was too dense. And it, it, with that density had continued, there wouldn't have been the life on the earth. So there had to be the expulsion of the moon yes, in yes. Steiner's teaching. Mm. So that there was a great expulsion of this moon body that mm-hmm. then is a, has a very complex story around that. But what's very fascinating about Steiner and, and, um, is that he, was, he talked a lot about what he called the Hibernian mysteries. Mm. Now, Hib- Hibernia means you. Either. I, Iber is you. Wow. Mm. And Hibernia was really the Isles of the You. So when, when he was talking about the Hibernian mysteries, Steiner was talking about the You. Yet he doesn't mention it one single time in his writings, as far as in, I understand. If somebody, please, one of your listeners, if yeah. there is a mention of it, he talks about Yggdrasil, and Yggdrasil is the You. So Steiner, mm. but Steiner knew this and he knew, but for some reason through the kinds of occult brotherhoods at that time, yeah. uh, I don't feel that he was privy to talk about it. Right. Um, right. And we know so that, we may you know, have known it, but, but he wasn't making it public. Mm. He wasn't. And, and, you know, I, I, and again, I'll say another, you know, another controversial thing was I had certain visitations from a being for, for a period of time while I was bringing the U Mysteries work and struggling with it and trying to find a language for it. it took me 25 years. Mm. And, and I kept encountering this being that was a, sort of a pure, inc- extraordinarily um, clear being that was just so supportive and so clear. And gradually I realized that it was, uh, it was Steiner. Really? And, um, Mm. And, he, and when I had the realization, he turned to me and he said, yes. And I got the feeling that he was really encouraging me to do this. I know it sounds quite grand. I don't mean this to sound no, kind of grandiose. No, 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 no not at all. It's, I mean, he was an extraordinary man with an extraordinary mission. So why wouldn't it continue on? <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was just beautiful, beautiful, uh, just being br- br- sort of breathed through by this being of just purity and, and love. Mm. And yeah. I felt this absolute affirmation from him saying, saying, do this, do, this, do yes, this is yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 you know, I can't go with a lot of the anthroposophical uh, material yeah. for probably obvious reasons. Mm. Um, but I do really value it. I think it's a phenomenal, mm. what can I say? A phenomenal contribution and yeah. what an amazing man that was, you know, well, you, you haven't, from the sound of it, you haven't been given a small task, have you? <laughs> the, you know, what, what you're being, what's being asked of you, I mean, just in the initiation you have, I mean, you really were put through a mill. Most of us wouldn't, wouldn't have survived. So, so what's being asked of you is obviously huge. So these you mysteries at some level, the you mysteries that, that, that you're now teaching uh, and, and, giving to um, humanity they they have got to be important um for where we're going so so do you want to tell us you know explain to us a little bit about the you mysteries i mean i know we're not going to (laughs) 
<laughs> get it all. Uh, no, it, no. Short talk, but give, give us a, a, a sense of what they are and why they're important, you know, because there is, I mean, the first time I heard of them, I could feel that, that pull, you know, I had, I, I've got quite a good, you know, I call it a tug, but when some, when some, when there's something that, you know, it's kind of, I can feel the, the energetic tug. And I felt that the moment I heard about these and, and it's kind of like, okay, so what is all that about? Yes. I mean, yes, the tug, yeah, that really, I think it's interesting. Many of the people who've come to the work have experienced a very similar, a very mm. similar phenomenon. Um, I mean, maybe I'll start with just, the the one of the earliest known words we have for the you and that can get us into the, the, mm. the this terrain yeah i think i think the earliest known word for the you actually is aya mm. uh, e, e y a yeah. which um is hithite and that means it was about from about 1750 or so bce and that means eternity and through uh, extension that i won't go into just now can also be said to mean to be touched by eternity Wow, yeah. Mm. And that comes out of uh, research that was done by Fred Hagenader and uh, that is available in some of his books, and he's done it another, another great pioneer of the U. Mm. So, so, so for me, these figures, these researchers were very important because I had for 25 years been struggling with this visceral, visual healing language that was, mm. was, was where do, who do, who's, who can help me with this? Yeah. So when I began to realize that there actually was pieces of research, there was some direction here. So I began to bring all of those together, my own experience together with some of the, the, the research that's ongoing. And, and um, through that began to bring together this mystery school. So the real premise of the mystery school is to really, is to go in the direction of Aya, to, yeah. to be able to, to be able to, to, to work with our, what I usually say to the students or the people who come in is that we're going to work with, uh, there, are four, there are four mantles, four mm. surfaces, four skins to mm. the percept perceptual work that one does in the, in yeah. the mysteries. And there's, a, the, there's the, a mantle of breath, there's a mantle of blood, there's a mantle of heart, and there's a mantle of mind. Right. Mm. And the you, the you is it, the you teaches how through each of these mantles, we can begin to find the original um, shape of a human being, the yeah. original, the original, what I call the dragon body, this original yeah. body that really couples us, is there, to, is there with us when we come into being as an embryo. Mm. It's, it's that body that, that is partly to do with the placenta, partly to do with the nourishing body that is there fully sentient before you or I even have anything that can be called a body. So there has to be something first yeah. that is there first yeah. that is not genetic. It's got nothing to do with genes. Mm. There, there's, of course, conception has occurred and there's genetics, but they're not active. There's no nervous system. Yeah. So the, sen the sentience, is, sentience is prior to that. Yes. So there's this great sentience that we begin to work with in the U mysteries to begin to come back into relationship with because that was the shape of the vector of the healing that I went through under the U yeah. was to rediscover these mantles and to begin to be able to be in a sense uh, remade in, in, in the image of the original, the original yeah. body, if you like. Yeah. Yes. Now that, does, that doesn't mean to say that therefore I go around having answers. It simply means that there's a series of principles there that we can work with to begin to get ready to yeah. be able to walk into the 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 world of these ancient views, yeah. and to be able to birth organs of perception, where we can touch in a way that doesn't involve our pushing nervous system that wants an outcome, it wants an experience, it wants to feel powerful, yeah. it wants to have something, it wants a possession. So we let go of all of that, and we find this these other surfaces that can touch and be touched by the eternity of the you. Yeah. And by the shining beings that are coupled to you, which we haven't really talked about today, but there's mm. the you is is a world of of extraordinary extraordinary 
shining beings mm. that are ready to speak into our sheaths, speak into our mantles. They're ready to communicate with us, to help us to be able to take the next steps we have to become differently incarnated beings, yes. differently embodied. And one of the biggest things about the U Mysteries is to really challenge what we mean by embodiment. Mm. So what we do in the U Mysteries is that we open ourselves up to becoming differently embodied human beings. That we, we then, through being, through then being gestured into that by working with the U's, we begin to perhaps get a glimpse of, of a body that we need for the future as a human being to continue yeah. to, to continue to stay with the evolution and development of the earth. Yeah. Now I'm not saying it's a messianic message of saying that's the only way that this can be done. Yeah. That we, that everybody must become a, you know, a <laughs> member of really ridiculous, but that actually the, the use in their very, the you doesn't, it doesn't, stand there saying hello i'm going to do this for you mm. it's quiet it says it doesn't give you an answer and in some ways they're the most difficult mysteries to approach because they don't really come to you and try and and, and touch your nervous system you have to be able to develop new organs and touching so, surfaces so in yourself it's definitely not this it's definitely not, say, it's not your nervous system so you're bypassing a whole in order to yeah uh, and yeah. yeah i can i can actually see you know with this sort of great evolutionary wave of energy that, that you know we're being exposed to now and the i can see why these have come in now really <laughs> yes yeah and the yeah, user great teacher we're kind of being softened up aren't we <laughs> yes we, re we really are i mean we can go the way of the earth as we are formed just now and as we are as we're agreeing and consult, consolidating in our addiction to materiality, we can continue on this path and we can go the path of the corpse of the earth or we can go the path of where the earth is trying to develop. Yeah. And, you know, we have, we have a choice and it's, it's, it will unfold. It's rapidly unfolding. It will unfold as we go. Yeah. Um, but the use of great teacher for It makes me wonder, you know, our choices, are we going to be the dinosaurs or are we going to be the birds that, that manage to sort of, come out of the dinosaurs <laughs> it's true it's true yeah. and and they use a great teacher to the blood and to the heart mm. and uh, the heart in a human being is not finished it's not a finished organ mm. and one of the key teachings in the you mysteries is that the is that the heart is an is, is an organ that is being has the potential to be taught by other worldly forces yeah mm -hmm. and but we must first open our heart to those <laughs> teachings and that's a difficult job for many of us and yeah. the heart the heart is an organ that has not finished yet and if we can learn to if we can learn to enter the world of the heart um in a way as a as a teacher of where the otherworldly forces can come to us yeah and teach us through this that there's a potential to to become differently embodied human beings as we move forward um, into the seed of the new earth, you know, because yes. the seed of the new earth is being planted now. Yeah. And, and uh, the and shining is, beings are involved in that. Yeah. So it isn't, it isn't, it isn't if that's going to happen. It definitely is going to happen. The question mark is really whether we're going to be part of it or not. <laughs> that is it. Yeah. It, it, mm. it, it's, it's happening. Yeah. And yeah. Can, can we go along with it or can we not go along with it? Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, do we do we become addicted to to transhumanism and 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 becoming um, the great individual who refuses to die and is going to be uh, you know linked to the corpse of the earth or do or do we or do we can or do we allow ourselves to become differently in body which might still involve dying but yeah into, um, but but rebirthing into something new exactly different yeah. exactly do we have the courage it's a fairly, to do that? It's a fairly stark choice actually. Yes. yes it's a fairly stark choice but actually any evolutionary leap is it is it's, yeah do especially have, do we have the courage for it like you know it took immense courage for you to to choose life um given the pressures and the forces that that, that were working on you um it's do we have that courage as a species 
it's mm -hmm. it's really true. And you know, I mean, I'll talk a lot about this this phrase that I, that I borrowed from elsewhere of the over specialized ego. Yeah. And you know, mm. and this comes this comes out of some uh, Jungian work that actually I think some pioneered New York City actually. Yeah. But that the the whole notion of the idea goes back to you know Darwin himself sort of exonerated the human brain from his own theories yes. that, you know, well, specialization everywhere else is going to lead to, to extinction. Ah, but the human brain knows no limits, so to speak. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that's exactly what he said because Darwin is much more complex mm. than he gets made out to be. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, so there's a lot of real, uh, there's a lot of real wisdom there with him mm. that mm. gets e easily washed over. But the, that this whole notion of, of over-specialization is that we have an over-specialized ego yes. that is three and a half thousand years in the making. And, <laughs> uh, and we're addicted to that. Yeah, we are. Mm. You know, mm. and that specialization is, is, is what's causing the, the, the rapidity of the demise of, of what we see around us. Mm. Um, you know, and in some ways I sometimes feel that, you know, that we talk about the, the biosphere mm. and we talk about the, 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 the neosphere which was the uh, Teilhard de Chardin's uh, idea of this informational sphere of the planet mm. that, that is kind of, let's say, some say that it was actually wrapped up inside of the biosphere. Other people might say that it was, a, it was another, another layer adjacent to the, to the biosphere, let's say. Mm. But, but this informational sphere, this, this sphere of mind in the mm. planet, and, and I once worked with a, a Russian physicist uh, while I was going through my healing. I was mm. looking for, looking for as one does when one's very sick, you look for things. Yeah. And I discovered this Russian physicist who ironically had been part of the cleanup of Chernobyl disaster for the Russian right. government. Mm. He then turned his back on that and gone to, gone to Siberia and spent his time with the Siberian shamans there. And he showed up in Aberdeen. Um, <laughs> as you do <laughs> as you yeah as, as you do Big why yeah. <laughs> why i don't know uh, i think for stone circles actually and i um joined him in aberdeen and he told me that the biggest danger that we face uh and these are her, these are his words were not so much the biosphere but the damage we're doing to the newosphere uh, the newosphere is the is is the he, he said was going to be the battleground right. for the new world mm-hmm that, you know, and he was very specific about the newosphere creates artificial bodies as beings can couple to the earth in a way that they, know they were not before able to couple to the earth and create influences that were not influence, able to influence before. Right. So he had, a very, he had a very interesting teaching about that. So yeah. in some ways, the, the, for me, the you mysteries are sort of an antidote to, the, to, to the, the demons and the demonic forces that are seeking to enter into the and turn the earth into a corpse through through the informational sphere. Yeah. So so in in um, some respects, you're you're teaching us to be warriors to combat that. In in, a, in the small way that 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 we're bringing it in. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Well, it's amazing. Um, I, I have to say, I'm so looking forward to learning more about these. <laughs> I'm welcoming welcoming you back to Wales. <laughs> Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited to be, to be coming back over. It'll be the third time this year. This has been quite a year for the U Mysteries and we've, yeah. it's, I, I, my first few times I did, the, when I first went back to Scotland, I never thought I would be bringing the work to Scotland and mm. I could barely, I could barely um, teach because I kept bursting into tears because <laughs> it was too much for me to yeah. be there, to do yeah. this after all the experiences. Mm. I'm, I'm a little, a little more stable now, but um uh, I'll have did some issues with me, <laughs> <laughs> just in case. Oh yeah, no, I'm prone. I'm prone. Um, we had um, a workshop in Seattle, mm. uh, on the, and that was uh, was full. Uh, full up. People are really interested because they're yeah, used on yeah. the Pacific Northwest. So we're birthing this mystery school now in, in Seattle, in Wales, and in, in, in right on the border soon in England. Yeah, and obviously in Scotland. Um, and it's 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 a it's it's now it's a growing work. It's yeah. really a growing work. It's well, it, you know that something's calling. Um, something. Well, I think anybody who's even partially awake knows something has to change. We can't go on the way we are, and and so yeah, this is this is 
obviously calling very strongly. Yes. So, yeah, well, I mean, all I can say is God bless you for hanging on in there. <laughs> Thank you for what saying that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been a challenging uh, time and, and uh, you know, it, it, in some ways it remains so. Mm. Um, there's, there's a lot of sacrifice. I don't, I don't mean that in a sort of poor me way, but just recently too, I've kind of looked around and I thought to myself, wow, wow. I, you know, I see people here in New England, they go and they go off to the beach and they do, yeah, yeah. Uh, my friends are going on life. <laughs> vacation, you know, and things like that. Yeah. I think, what's, what, oh, what's that? You know, and yeah. I don't, I, I don't, you know, it, it just doesn't occur to me. And I think that there is a certain amount of compulsion and sacrifice yeah. that it wears on those around you and, yeah. and they have, they have, they take the brunt of it. So, so it's hard for people around I mean, me as well. It's not an easy path for, for anyone. Once, once. Once you commit to this, you're on board 24-7, aren't you? And You are, yeah. Mm. And people come into your life, it, it's, it's hard for them. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, I, 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 I have the highest respect for those that stick by me and uh, can still ask me how I'm doing and, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> invite, invite me out every once in a while. You know? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. yeah, well, thank you so much. I mean, I... I this is your evening and you've you've literally finished work and, and now you're talking to me so I, oh, <laughs> at wow. some point at some point i let you go to go and get your dinner and uh, and just just have a you know some relaxation time but i i can't well it's been it's been stunning it's been wonderful and uh, you know there is i can feel there is so much more um to learn so God bless you for it. And I'm really, really looking forward to, uh, to, to finding out more myself. And for anyone who is interested in finding out more, I'll make sure that your website is, is uh, on the slide that comes at the end of this so that they can go to your website and find out where you're running workshops and things. Thank and you, Sarah. I, I, I had a hint from someone that you might be writing a book as well. Is that right? Yes, I am. I'm, I'm, I have the basic book um, there. It's about 400 pages of writing and yeah. going through the process of editing it down mm. just now. So <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, it's really the story that I, some of the story I, I shared with you today, mm. but much more, in much more detail yeah. uh, with a lot of Scottish dialect. So. <laughs> well, we should look forward to that coming out. It's a bit like train spotting meets the yew tree, something like that. <laughs> if you could even possibly imagine that. That's mind boggling. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not a very good image, but. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, thank you so much for, for what you've shared with us. As I say that, you know, there, there is obviously so much more that sits behind this. So I hope it's, it's piqued people's curiosity. I hope so. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me, Sarah. And I'm really looking forward to seeing you in just a few weeks time. Just a few weeks time. Yes. I'm looking yeah. forward to that as well.